Good morning. Welcome to Heritage Baptist Church Bible Study. Uh, last week we were covering, and this is where we left off at. We'll cover a couple of things as we get started on it. Remind you of that Christians have an outline plan. Let's let's look at your Bible. Got, get Colossians out there. Turn with us over to the book of Colossians, and we'll look at chapter number three of the book of Colossians. Um, the scripture is wonderful and filled with all kinds of things. Colossians is a very intricate, detailed uh, description, and it's 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 just one line right after the other of all these things about Christianity, especially those of us who know the Lord. It says, if you then be risen with Christ, and I, try, I explained that to you last week, that's like we say, did, did, you, did you know better than that? Well, sure you did. We're not saying you didn't know better. We're, t- we're proving to you you did. And he, he went through it, and he talked about that we're dead, that we're sealed. Our soul is separated from our flesh by the Spirit of God. That's what makes us new creatures in Christ. And then we start in verse 5. It says, Mortify therefore your members which upon the earth. And that's where we're going to finish up when we finish our lesson today. Now, that word, mortify, means to what? Put to death. And so uh, that thing that God sees us, we're already dead, that is separated from the flesh, but our job in the world is to act like it. You didn't get saved because you weren't sinners. You got saved because you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and He saved you, sealed you, keeps you, and the Holy Spirit then resides within you, and you learn from Him. But the world will not know what's in there until you prove it to them. And so people who proved it in the book of Acts were first called Christians, or like Christ, at Antioch. And so we talked to you that Christians have an outline plan in these first four verses. Fret not yourself because of evildoers. Psalms 37, 1 through 9. Trust in the Lord, do good. Delight thyself in the Lord. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. And every, everything, how many of you guys, everything works out just like you planned it? And everything was good, right? So I've, I, my plan for Christianity when I first got saved was pretty simple. I was going to just tell the world about Jesus and everybody was going to get saved, just one right after the other like dominoes. Well, it didn't work. And we, and we still, we do a lot of things now to be able to and cease from anger and forsake wrath. That is a big problem. And we'll talk, we, we'll talk about that, and we talked about it a lot last week. The change in believers because of their faith. When we trust Christ as Savior, we act different and live different. Now, I'm going to tell you, every time in your life <laughs> you start a new relationship, it changes you. If you got married and you didn't change, It didn't last, did it? I don't know what's wrong with her. I acted the same as I always did. You know? Well, see, we expect the people we're married to act like they're married. And we pretty much won't tolerate if they don't. And so I would kind of like to be married to somebody, which I'm fortunate to do, that likes me sometimes, okay? At least sometimes better than no time at all, right? But if we got married... or when you had children, how did that go with you? You know, the biggest change that came along was in you. Yeah. You weren't up to 2 o'clock watching movies. You were up at 2 o'clock feeding babies and changing them and moving. And your whole life changed. You remember when we used to? All right. You, you have great things in your lifetime you never dreamed before. When our babies, my first was, was, was that was before, uh, what are the throwaway di- disposable diapers? And they still had cloth diapers, you know, and you had to wash them out and all that. Can you, can you see all the new moms right now thinking about that? And so, and one of the easiest ways to do it was to put it, you know, the wash it down in the toilet, you know, because that way, but never turn loose of it after you flush the toilet. So... <laughs> And because uh, if you did, it flooded your whole kitchen and stuff that went with it. But we, 
I, I know that from a story that I've heard. I can Okay, but see, but see, everything about your life, every area of it changes. You and you and there's when you were just you and your husband, you, you know, you could do that one, two loads of laundry a week, and all of a sudden you got it has three outfits, and you're doing eight loads of laundry a week. It, everything changed, and it, and it changes. You went on. And remember when your grocery bill was, you know, you, you it, it was cheaper to go out and eat when it was just you and him before. That was before you had kids. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. See, you know who changed the most when you had you got married and you changed the most when you got kids? Can I tell you that it's the same thing in a friendship, guys? When you 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 knew order up the, the relationship of a friendship, anytime you had anybody in a relationship into your life, you it changes who you are. You you adopt somebody as a as a parent. Maybe your parents are gone and you adopt somebody into your life as a parent. That changes your life. You find yourself over there doing things and working and stuff. Okay. Why would we think that when we come into a relationship with Almighty God that we, we wouldn't be different? See, that is everything in our whole physical world tells us better than that. Not just the emotional attachment, but the way we are. And Paul would say that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable under his death. And is there a mom in here that sometime when you were raising a kid and the kid got hurt or the kid got emotionally broken and they were dealing with all that relationship and tears that you didn't cry with them? Was there? They had this great big disappointment in their life they'd always wanted to do and it didn't work out. And you said, yeah, that's the way life is. Yeah, I could see that. You know what I mean? But no, you, you just can't do it. You know you did. You got emotionally caught, caught up in it. Being made conformable unto his death. If by any means might attain to the resurrection of the dead. Now, we're not trying to work to give you your resurrection. He didn't say that. He's saying, I want to be worth it. If he really did raise from the dead, he said, because I live, you live also, then I should, it should show, right? There's what he said. Not as though it already attained, see that? Either we're already perfect, but I follow after, if that by I may apprehend that for which I'm apprehended of Christ Jesus. Why did the Lord leave, save you and leave you here? So you could live a Christian, Christ-like, life in the world in whom you shine like lights in the world. And that lights the Lord Jesus shining in us or out of us. And I, I promise you that'll be the hardest job you ever had in your whole lives. And so Christians have a purpose life. And then let's look at this. Number one, in verse one, he said that we're to seek those things which are above. All of a sudden, all the stuff in the whole world didn't change. You know that, right? Old age changes you more in your physical appetite than Christ does. Because if you got saved, I grew up in the country south place. I still like collard greens, fried okra, and pinto beans. Okay? Didn't change that part. But those parts of my life that I was seeking after other stuff, all, most of my life, I decided I was tired of being a poor farmer's guy's kid, and I wanted to be have more money. And I worked all my life, and I worked through high school and all the other things and got my education early so that I could be an engineer. And I got saved and never used it, ever, because all of my desire about what I wanted in my life changed. Nothing wrong with being an engineer. You understand that? But I'm the one that begged God, say, look, can I just serve you? Can I, can I tell people what I heard? And I finally put enough pressure on him. I promise you, I preached everywhere I could preach. My, my pastor didn't care that if I went off to school or not, so I found me a church that would take me as their 17th associate, and I could... Mail in. I, I wouldn't have worked in a small church. You understand that? They just figured me out in the second day. 
But in that big church, it, it was hard. It was easy to hide with all that stuff. And you had all these other preachers around you that were associate pastors. And I learned stuff from them, just like soaking it up, guys. You understand? Uh, they would teach this one when they teach that one. And several of them kind of kind of took me under the hand and a little bit. And so you learned a lot of stuff. But I I said, I, I want to preach somewhere. You know, can you want me to preach in junior church? I'll do that. You know, I can't preach in junior church. Can I preach at the nursing home? And I preach at wherever I could go. I preached, I preached in Presbyterian churches, military bases, uh, uh, Knights of Columbus halls on the street. And, and finally, the Lord said, well, I guess I might as well give him a church because he's going to preach anyhow. So <clears throat> I got to come to Texas and they couldn't find a pastor and I was the only one that would take it. So they, they got I got a church. All right. God allowed me to preach. That's what I wanted to do. He never forced me to do that. And he never has. It's always easy to quit. It's easy to quit being married. Christians are as actually they're more prone to do that than if you read statistics. And I understand you say, well, lost people don't get married. You don't know saved people lately, do you? I can probably name five or six couples right now. They're living together. Both claim to be saved, not married. You know why? Because it's easier to leave. You don't have to do divorce stuff. But Christian divorce rates are higher than non-Christian divorce rates because it's easy to quit. How many parents, you know, just decided to quit? It's too much trouble. I'm just going to quit. I thought when they got to be 18, this would be over. And they were going to be sending money home every week, and I would be able to retire and move out. You know, my dad was, he would always say, you know what? This is our plan for when you guys all get older. We don't have enough money to retire, but everybody that will send me 100 bucks a month, I won't come stay with you. <laughs> He never, I never missed a check, guys. I promise you. I love my mom and dad, but never missed a check. And uh, see, there you go. All right. But of course, he had 11 kids, so he had a, more income coming in. So <clears throat> I'm sure that worked out really well. We seek those things which are above. And then look at this set your affection on things that are above. You know what's easy for you to do what you want to do? My granddaughter let me know that she, on, in a track meet, she won first place in the one mile run. And second place in the in the, the two mile run, and then she won third place in a in a relay race, and she's she's so excited and stuff, and she's going, talking to me about how much fun it was to run the mile, and I'm thinking maybe one time, but not right now. You know what I mean, Amen. Right. So I had an older pastor friend one time years ago, and he the doctor said you need more exercise. He said if I could get the car in the house, drive from the recliner to the refrigerator, I would. And so, but uh, uh, I'm telling you guys, what, what what do we, our love for the world things has to kind of back off. And when they don't do that, that finds you at some sports activity on Sunday instead of at church. And, and then you say, well, you know, I'm, I'm faithful to God and I'm faithful to my wife. I only cheat on her once a month. And so I'm, I have a standard. See, then you're not faithful. And there's things and everybody in church is different. We all have that kind of stuff. As you get older, you're going to find there are a lot of things going to keep you out of church like you. You know what I mean? And so all of us that go through those wonderful procedures, you know, where they check stuff to make sure you're okay to do other stuff. And that keeps you out of church every once in a while. And we are glad. So, so don't get, don't, don't I'm just telling you, faithfulness is the best you can do. To get old enough, come to Sunday morning, it'll be probably one of the best things you can do. You're still faithful. God knows what faithful limits are for you. Set your affection on things that are above. So who, who do you want to please? So you want to please God, right? Then this one, you're dead. You're not dead in the flesh, but spiritually you're alive, and that separates your soul from your flesh. And so that means for the first time in your whole existence, you're not under control of the body. Matter of fact, Paul said, if you listen to him, I, I beat my body. I bring it under subjection. He said, now you have the opportunity to be in authority over it. Good luck with that one. Because that's the battle every Christian I know fights all their life. And you remember Jesus and the, and the moat in the guy's eye and the beam in the other eye? That's your biggest problem as a Christian. 
You can figure out everything that's wrong with everybody else and never see one thing that's wrong with you. That is your big opportunity. You say, what do I do? Ask God. God, show me what's wrong with me. I ain't doing that. You know what I mean? All right. You're hid. Do you know where most of the Jews live today? Probably 30 or 40 times as many, maybe more than 100 times as many, I haven't counted, live outside of Israel instead of inside of Israel. Because the 10 tribes never came back. Even the ones that are coming back from Russia and all, that was part of the two tribes that stayed. They're the ones that went out into the Romans, the ones that went out into the Bab Babylonians, and they never came back, the 10 tribes. Then the Assyrians, they're scattered all over the world. Remember what the Bible says? Jesus said, you know what? Here's what the kingdom of heaven's like. A guy goes in the field, he finds the treasure, hides it in the field, and he buys the whole field so he can get the treasure. That's Israel. And he buys the whole world to get Israel back. Well, believe this or not, you might think that you're an open target, but in God, you're hid in Him. Nobody's going to get you out. You can't be lost. He knows exactly where you are. And that's I like that stuff. You mean? God knows. And we hope. Our hope is that we have, we're going to be with Him in glory. Now, how many of you guys like physics? I mean, this physics. You, you may not believe this, but see the chair you're sitting on? It's moving. See this, this, this podium thing? It's moving. Everything in this room is moving. Sin preacher's got a little problem again. No, no, no. You know, you know that stuff we're talking about at the atomic level? Everything's moving. It's not really steel. And we, we understand that. Yet I know that I can set my coffee on this shelf and it won't fall through it on the ground. Right? How do y'all deal with that? Do you deny the science? You know I can prove that's true? Nuclear weapons prove that's true. Because when you break things apart, nuclear level, it destroys everything around it. Right? So here's the deal. What do we do? Well, because we're in this world of solid stuff, we weld it and move it and do all kinds of stuff with it because we can manipulate the materials and make chairs out of it and sit on them and do all the others. But we know that one of these days, Peter said, it'll all just fall apart. And it will melt with fervor and heat, all the whole creation. Because God will just let it fall apart. What keeps it together? Colossians 1. All things are made by Him and for Him and they're held together by His mind. When He gets ready for that, you say, well, I'm scared to even sit in a chair. I'm afraid I'll just fall on the ground. Well, there wouldn't be any ground either. You, you understand that? Everything God does. And He made such a great... You don't live in that. You live in right now. What your hope is is that right now won't be forever. <coughs> and so you can take any kind of practical science and you, you see that same thing in every area of it. We're all going to be changed. When God changes all that, we'll be changed. Oh, we're already halfway there. I, don't, I wouldn't say halfway, but at least third because we're new creatures in Christ because we have the Lord living on the inside. No Old Testament saint had what you have. They were promised it. They just couldn't figure out how that's going to work. How could God? God said, I'll give you a new spirit and a new heart. And how could he do that? Remember what Nicodemus asked Jesus? He said, you got to be born again. And he said, do I have to go back in my mother's womb and come back out? Is that not what he said? And Jesus said, no, that which is flesh, and then there's that which is spiritual. 
The man has to be born of the water. He's born out of his mom's womb, and then he has to be born of the Spirit. That's why we call it being born again. That's where our hope is. See, that we've just started. This is not the end for us. We, we're on the we're on way. And Paul's going to tell you, don't get caught up in only what you have right now. How many times you tell your kids, grow up. Start thinking about what the consequences are, how you live, what you do, where you are, and how much it affects other people. We really do, guys. Do you understand that? One of the biggest mistakes anybody ever makes in the breakup of a home and family is saying, ah, it won't affect anybody but me. That's not true. It affects everybody. And it just ripples down through the way. It affects everybody. Those that are closest first, and then those that are far away, down the way. We do it. Every time a preacher messes up, it may take, take five years for somebody to figure it out, but every time, I've talked to people who say, you know, man, this guy did that and that and that and that, and you know what, and that, that was the guy that, that talked me into serving the Lord that showed me how to be saved and I was in his youth group. And See, uh, our hope is, is that we're not going to stay the way we are, fighting the battles that we fight, living in disappointment. That's not it. We're not saying it didn't affect us. We're saying we're not going to let it stop us because I have hope. Now, there was an admiral during the Vietnam War that was flying an aircraft, and he was one of the first ones. He was the highest-ranking military man that was taken as prisoner, and he spent the longest time in, in, in a Hanoi prison camp. If you ever listen to him give his testimony, he's a Christian man. He said the people that made it were those who kept hope but understood it wasn't going to happen tomorrow. Those people who bought that stuff, well, we'll have a peace treaty by Christmas, and, and it didn't happen, and it didn't happen. I believe he stayed there nine years. Said so those people either went crazy or went or killed themselves or got killed. It was the ones who said, okay, we, we got a hope. We haven't lost it, but it's down there. Hope is out there. And the Bible says in the book of Hebrews that hope is an anchor. Hope is the anchor, and it's in the throne room of God. Yeah, that's where it's at. I'm just not there yet. So we got that going. Let's look at this, and we'll go through it a little bit. Maybe not get very far. Ha. And so, anyhow, it's fun. Christians have a purpose life. Colossians 3, 1, seek. And we'll look at it here. If the risen with Christ, then it says, seek those things which are above. There you go. Therefore, take no thought for what shall eat, what shall drink, or wherewithal shall be clothed, for all these things do the Gentiles seek. Sorry, Gentiles. Oh, that's us. Never mind. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And I live in a world where verse 34 becomes a big part. Take no thought for tomorrow. The morrow. Uh, how many of you guys are thinking about, wonder how much savings I'll have left at the end of this decade? Mm -hmm. See, that's, we don't know, okay? And so what goes with it? For tomorrow uh, shall take thought of the things of itself sufficient to the day's evil thereof. Does that mean we don't try? No. <clears throat> this means we don't know exactly every answer. Now you see, what you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to gather up gold, real gold, <clears throat> and I'm going to keep it in my safe at home. Don't tell anybody, okay? And so, but I'm going to keep it in my home. And so when the whole economy of the United States goes under, I'll have gold. What are you going to do with that gold? Okay, what, what is an ounce of gold worth right now? What? 1800 bucks, or an ounce of gold, that's not very big. So when you go to the store and you're going to buy 
or to a farmer and you want milk or bread or something, is he going to bite off a chunk? If he does, take your gold. How's he going to give you change? You understand? That's a, it, 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 see, a lot of that stuff only works for us when there is a money system in order to protect us. I, I don't know about you guys, but if I had to trade an ounce of gold for enough food for my, or one meal for my family, I'd probably do it without any thought and not ask for any change. So it's better than nothing, but it's not the perfect answer for everything. Every, there has to be some kind of subsidy or a sub-based economy system to make it work. This is, this is worth how much? And she said $1,800. The gold never changes value. Next week, it'll be worth 22000 because the money goes down. The gold isn't going up. Y'all got that, right? So good. What, what can you do about all that? I don't know you're going to do anything because I know finally in the world there's going to be a one world system that has covers the, the, the government of it, the political and the financial and the religious. And you already got it written out in the book. So hang in there, guys. We'll make it, right? Number two, set your affection on things above. Why? Because they don't change. Heaven doesn't change. Matter of fact, I like that song. Heaven sounding sweeter all the time. So we, we got it. What should we say? Should we continue in sin that grace may abound? Mm, no, because that's not where your affection is supposed to be. Look at verse 3. Know you not that so many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized to his death? And remember, that's what we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be, you get to verse 5, he's going to say mortify. That we're supposed to die to the world. I, you go to the funeral, um, to the gravesite with me tomorrow sometime, and we'll you'll never find anybody buried out there saying, I want more flowers. You know, one of the coolest things about funerals, and most people don't get it, I tell them all the time and they're shocked. <gasps> funerals are for the living people. The guy that's dead don't know. We put all those flowers up there. You can't smell. You've never seen one raise up and go, oh, I love these things. He's dead. Right? Well, not only can you not see, if you ever done that, then you won't be sitting up with the dead no more. Right? Amen. I have a couple of stories, but I'm not going to tell them. I'm going to get this far from there. Yeah. So uh, we, <clears throat> anyhow, I, when I first came to Texas, I'll, I'll probably finish with this today. I do this, but. I, I found friendship in the oldest group of pastors. I was not quite 25, and I found preachers that were already in their 60s because that's who I seemed to fit in with the best, okay? And they most of them had really great works, and they were doing well in some of the largest churches in the whole area, and they were only little boogers, uh, older boogers, I'm telling you right now. And so... They were telling me about sitting up in with, with the dead. Y'all remember sitting up with the dead? How many of y'all ever sit up with the dead? Anybody ever sit up? This just a couple of us? Huh. That was three or four. That was a common thing. <coughs> you ever go sit around in the dark with a body in somebody's house and and where they the old adults told stories and talked about their life and stuff. And it was sort of like a, a release for the family, you know, with it. And they took them out the next day and then buried them together. Well. These guys were sitting up with, in a funeral home because the family didn't want to stay, so three of them were staying in the funeral home. So they got tired of watching, said this, this janitor walking around sweeping with a broom. They thought, we're going to scare him to death. We're just going to have fun with this. And so they rolled the casket out, rolled in an empty one, and one of the preachers got in it yeah. and laid down and said, sure enough, here come the sweeper guy. I said, he's sweeping along and said the guy in the in the the preacher in the casket sat up and said, hey, quiet down. I'm trying to rest in here. <laughs> and he said they thought the guy would get scared and run away, but he didn't. He said they had one of them big old commercial brooms, you know, that weighs about nine pounds. And he used it like a baseball bat and knocked him right back down into the casket. <laughs> knocked him out cold. <laughs> said we were the ones that were shocked. We had to grab our brother and take him to the hospital to make sure he wasn't killed. Okay. All right. We're, uh, 
We don't sit up with the dead anymore, but we know where the dead go. And we know to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Why not set your affection where you're going? Anybody ever traveled to Hawaii, but you went and bought skis and stuff for the snow? Now, I have been on the mountains in Hawaii and have seen it snow, okay, but not enough for you to ski on. But I want you to understand that. We set our affection. We, do, we add that way. Uh, it works really good with your kids. It works really good with your spouse. It works really good with your church. It works really great with God. Set your affection on things that are above. All right, I'm going to stop right there, and we're going to move into something for next week. And uh, I'll get into this part the, next week, and I'm going to move down to where I want you to look at. In my class, we're going to look at the definition of two words today. And, uh, and uh, one of them is lasciviousness. You'll find that in your Bible in the New Testament only. And you're, it's mentioned in Mark 7. It said, from uh, far from within, out of the heart of man, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornication, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness. Okay? An evil eye. And... Uh, Blasphemy, pride, foolish, all these things done. I heard a preacher one time say the evil eye is when you look at the wrong woman and wink. So I'm, I'm not sure what that would be, but I'm thinking he's talking more about lust and desire than he would be about winking, okay? Now, and then 2 Corinthians, he says the same thing, but he said, lest I come again, my God will humble me among you that I may should be well. That, that's kind of being, means to be hollered at. Many which have sinned already and have not repented of the uncleanness, fornication, and lasciviousness which they've committed. And again in Galatians chapter 5. Same thing everywhere. It means unnatural desires, not control. Unnatural desires. And there are a lot of things to me that seem extremely unnatural. I, I, when I read my Bible, they don't seem natural to me, even with Bible characters. And why a guy would want 300 wives like Solomon. You know, you'd have a mother-in-law at your house every day of the year. <laughs> every day. Think about that. In the reality, Solomon could not love either one of them. And, and he had 300 wives and 700 concubines. And he said, out of men, you can find one now, good man. But he said, out of a thousand women, I found none. See, I can't believe that they were all bad. I just think he didn't know how to love either one of them. See, God meant for us to have a... It's not natural. God made us together in the beginning. Jesus said the strangest thing. He said he made them male and female, and he only made one for Adam. He could have made as many as he wanted, couldn't he? Sure he could have. But he only made one. And then he said, now I want you to fill the whole earth with people. Why didn't he make 15 or 20? So he didn't. God allowed a lot of things under the old covenant because it was way broader than you think. In the old covenant, we talked with our son kids. You know, you could, <clears throat> you could have more than one wife. In the New Testament, he said a man's supposed to love the wife like he does the church, so that kind of limits it to one. There's only two places that he said if you are married, divorced, or remarried, you can't be. You can't be a pastor or a deacon. You can be a Sunday school teacher, missionary. You can be an evangelist. You can be the church cleaner. You can mow the yard. You can serve God. You can teach a Sunday school class. You can do all that kind of stuff, okay? But, but, and, and there's a reason for it. I'll tell you later. But because of that, our society that came out of a Christian society has that standard that you, and long as it was Christian based, you're only supposed to have one wife at a time. Right? Now, and before you get all peeved out there, write me letters. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, say that divorce is a sin. It's what causes divorce that's sin. Okay? Think about what I just said. God gave rules for divorce. He never gave rules for sin. Thou shalt not steal, but if you do, here's what you get. Here's how you have to do it. See, he didn't do that. That's part of life, guys. Get used to it. But lasciviousness is not a natural. It's an unnatural desire. And you could talk about all kinds of things that are going on in the world around us today 
that are not natural. And so there's a couple more spaces. Then there's this word concupiscence. It, in that it is uncontrolled natural desires. It means a letting the natural things getting out of order, out of control. And Paul said, I beat my body. I bring it under subjection. I used the verse already in the teaching today. Well, you, you've got to do that. It really is hard. How many of you guys like to eat as much as me? I like eating. And my body's trained to eat three times a day where I need it or not. I remember one of my doctors one time said, well, only eat when you're hungry. I said, that's a stupid rule. Who made that up? You know? Have you ever been to a birthday party? Come on, you know. <clears throat> so we, there's a whole, we, we have to learn to control those things, you know, our, our emotions and everything else. So with that said, we're going to get cover a little bit of that next week. And I want you to use it and you can see the verses in it. And uh, I think I got a whole active set of these as well. There's, there's the three times that it's listed in the New Testament. Never listed. Neither one of those words are listed in the Old Testament. And that proves that the word of God is accurate a little better. Okay. Right now we're going to close. We'll pick up where we left off. We'll take up article three next week and, and go through it. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to study your word. And Lord, we learn a lot of things, not just English and not just Latin words and things that help us to understand what they mean. But Lord, the practicality of living a Christian spiritual life is a physical evil world. The world has never been a good place. It will never be the perfect place because that's our hope is that we're going there and we're leaving this world behind. Help us as we remember that daily and we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.